Great. Well, glad you all could make it. Um, we are here, as you know, to talk about accessibility and procurement. Um, and let me share my screen. You can see my slides. Uh, and I, I'm realizing I didn't introduce myself. I am Terrell Thompson. I'm manager of the IT accessibility team within UWIT Accessible Technology Services. So our, and many of my colleagues introduced themselves early on, but we all are part of the IT accessibility team working across the university to try and ensure that all of our technologies are accessible. And so obviously we can't do that on our own, but that but we uh, do that by providing consulting and support and, and doing trainings and developing resources and just you know, trying to move the ball forward as, as much as we can, wherever we can. Uh, with regard to technology accessibility. And so that's that's what we're all about. Um, I do want to share a few acronyms. These will all be defined in context as we go through, but just to give you a heads up that we are going to be, uh, it's going to be a bit of an acronym soup. Um, and uh, the first of those is W3C, World Wide Web Consortium. Uh, we'll be talking about standards for accessibility. The WCAG, as I like to pronounce it, um, some people pronounce it a little bit differently than that, but that is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, which is published by the W3C. Uh, the W3C also publishes ARIA, Accessible Rich Internet Applications, which is going to come into play. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the, the tool that vendors use to declare their, their current state of accessibility, and that is a VPAT, a Voluntary Product Accessibility Template. And we're going to be talking briefly about the law, um, the ADA, uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act. And I'm going to actually kick things off with that um, piece of information. This is not a legal presentation, so we're not going to dwell extensively on this. But if you haven't heard already, um, there are new rules issued by the Department of Justice for Title II of the ADA, uh, new rules that specifically address uh, digital accessibility. They require that all websites and mobile apps, and I've got some uh, in quotes here directly from the rules, um, websites and mobile apps that a public entity provides or makes available directly or through contractual licensing or other arrangements must be accessible. And so that piece that I quoted and bolded here on the slide speaks to the need for procurement and accessibility to be addressed in procurement because it's not just stuff that we are building, it's stuff that we are buying. If it's a website, if it's a mobile app, and we're relying on a third party vendor to provide that content, then it does need to be accessible. And a couple of additional details here from the rule. One is that the new rule establishes what exactly the standard is for accessibility. How is accessibility going to be measured? And that is WCAG 2.1 level 2A, which I'll define uh, more specifically in a moment. And, and that <clears throat> we have a deadline. So April 24th, 2026 is the date by which um, all of our stuff, with a few exceptions, there are some exceptions, um, but most of our websites and mobile apps need to be compliant by that date. And so we've got you know, two years, a little bit less than two years now to really be actively pursuing this, both with the things that we build and the things that we buy. So we're here today to talk mostly about the things that we buy. Um, for more information, there is uh, information on, uh, there's a whole page dedicated to the final rule uh, on the ADA office website. Um, and these slides will be distributed later. Um, and, uh, and actually, since Beth is here from the ADA office, you know, or anybody who has that URL, if you wanted to paste it into the chat, that would be super helpful. But that's kind of... Uh, you know, the best place to go uh, for now, you know, to get the latest information on what we know about what's required uh, via the ADA rule. So we have on our website, on the Accessible Technology website at uw.edu slash access tech, a page on procurement policies and procedures. So if you just add slash procurement to that URL, then you get to this page. 
And it basically breaks down the the kind of the areas where accessibility plugs into the procurement process, breaks it down into uh, three areas. There are three steps. We need to consider accessibility from the beginning when we reach out to vendors and we start talking to them about you know, their product or their service. So that's step one, solicit accessibility information. If we don't ask for accessibility information, then vendors you know, probably aren't gonna provide it. So we, we have to ask. Step two, we need to, to validate the accessibility information received. So when they respond to our questions about accessibility, we need to be able to make some determination of whether we can trust that information and whether that is valid information. And finally, step three, we need to include accessibility assurances in contracts. Um, so as we're negotiating an agreement with a vendor, then we need to make sure you know, they are agreeing to either improve their accessibility if they're not already there, or um, uh, make sure that they you know, stay accessible even after, you know, after we license the product, if they continue to update it, accessibility still needs to be there. So we're gonna, this is kind of the scaffolding for our entire presentation. I'm gonna talk about steps one and two, and then Lynn's gonna take over and talk about uh, step three, accessibility assurances in contracts. So step one, solicit accessibility information. Uh, there's sample language for an RFP that's on that, on that website that I, um, uh, linked to and just referenced. And so we've got a lot of text here and I'm not gonna read all of this, but just a few things that are bolded that we actually state that um, that a, a bidder or vendor of an IT product needs to comply, their product or the service needs to comply with the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.1 Level 2A. And we actually have said this for a long time. That's the standard that we had come up with. Um, and actually the state of Washington had adopted this um, for all state agencies. And we as a university have declared that that's the standard we wanna meet. And now the ADA rules have adopted the same standard. And so, so nothing has changed that you know, that is the standard we're trying to meet. And once again, I'll talk a little bit more about what that standard requires in a moment. Also this, specifies that a VPAT, a Voluntary Product Accessibility Template, um, is a means by which vendors can declare how well they support that standard. And we are very specific in what we expect when it comes to VPATs. Um, it needs to be version 2.3 or higher. And the rest of the text after that bolded text describes what our expectations are regarding a VPAT. It should be a well filled out VPAT. There's, you know, some vendors kind of cut corners and, you know, provide a VPAT that really is not um, very carefully uh, filled out, and that's that's not what we're looking for. There are some specific expectations that we have, so we're trying to make it clear with this boilerplate language, you know, that can get plugged into RFPs. So what is WCAG 2.1 level 2A that we keep talking about? Um, it is the from the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, which is the group that sets a lot of web standards, um, HTML, CSS, um, and many, many more. Those are W3C specifications or W3C standards. So this was an organization that was created in the very early days of the web to kind of you know, oversee um, things related to the web. And so um, they very early in the history of the web started realizing that the web could erect barriers for people with disabilities, which was not the vision, you know, with what the web was all about. And so they uh, formed a, a group called the Web Accessibility Initiative within the W3C, and they got busy working on guidelines. And the very first version of WCAG, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, was published in 1998. And since then, it's been kind of on a 10-year cycle where they would update uh, every 10 years. So 2008, we got version 2.0. 2018, we got version 2.1. And October of last year, we got version 2.2. Uh, so it's actually interesting that version 2.2 is the latest version 
but the new ADA rules um, went back a version and settled on version 2.1. They felt like that's been around long enough um, that people, organizations, web developers, product developers have figured out how to comply with version 2.1. 2.2 is new enough that it adds some some additional requirements. And so it hasn't has not proven itself yet. And so they they ended up um, you know, deciding to stick with version 2.1. So version 2.1 has 78 specific success criteria. So if you drill into WCAG, then that's kind of the, the deepest level. Uh, success criteria are sort of measurable checkpoints on you know, what it means to be accessible. And each success criterion has a level assigned to it, level A, 2A, or 3A. And those um, correspond with uh, kind of the priority, level A or a higher priority, but also with difficulty. Um, some things in level 3A might actually be a high priority, but they're they're very difficult to accomplish. And so, so they kind of balanced those things and came up with this, this level, um, you know, system for identifying you know, priority and difficulty. And over the years, it has emerged that level A and level 2A are the success criteria that kind of are the bar. That's what we are expected to meet. And that now is confirmed in the new rules that accompany the ADA. So we have to meet 50 success criteria under WCAG 2.1 level 2A. So I think the best way to get a sense of what these are is to look at a few. And, and this actually comes into play when you are validating um, whether you know, a vendor knows what they're talking about you know, when they are sharing, whether they're accessible. Um, it's a lot to ask everybody who's making a purchasing decision to understand all 50 success criteria that are under WCAG 2.1 level 2A. Um, that really is the realm of accessibility experts and not everybody's expected to be an accessibility expert. But I think if you can just focus on three and really kind of get to understand these three success criteria, they can go a long way um, toward uh, you being able to make some some intelligent de decisions about whether this product is accessible or not. So the first of those is 1.3.1. That's the uh, you know, the nomenclature. You know, within WCAG, they've got all success criteria are numbered. Um, and so 1.3.1 is info and relationships. It is a level A um, success criterion. And this has to do with structure. So it's the underlying structure within a web page. Um, web pages need to have headings and applications, web applications, and digital documents like PDF and Word documents all need to have headings and subheadings and sub subheadings that sort of form an outline of the content of the page or the document. And screen reader users depend on having that structure. So somebody who's blind using a screen reader um, can, can jump through headings on a web page by hitting the letter H in, in most in Windows screen readers. And so they can jump from heading to heading to heading and just kind of get a bird's eye view of the organization, you know, of the document. And that also you know, facilitates navigation if they can just jump from heading to heading and then go right to the section that meets their needs. Similarly, uh, if you've got a form that you're trying to fill out that's online and there are labels that are associated with form fields that tell us you know, what goes in this form field, um, you know, maybe this is where we're supposed to enter our name. So it may say you know, name immediately above the form field. Well, that label needs to be coded properly so that it is explicitly associated with that form field. Otherwise, you know, if it's near near the form field, that's a visual reference, but it's not exposed to somebody who's who can't see it and is using assistive technology. So this is the underlying code needs to communicate all that kind of stuff, the relationships between the parts. Same thing with tables. If you've got data tables, you've got rows and columns of information. Those need to be coded properly in order for screen readers to understand them. 
And so that that's one of the three because it's so critical that that structure, having that underlying structure is a really important piece of the accessibility puzzle. The second one um, in my three success criteria to get, get familiar with is 2.1.1, which is keyboard accessibility. It too is a level A success criterion. And that just says that all functionality of the content, the application of the page, should be operable through a keyboard interface. So if you would be inclined, if you're a mouse user with eyesight and you would be inclined to hover over something or click on something in order to get some kind of functionality or access some content, then take the no mouse challenge and try doing that same thing without a mouse using the keyboard alone. And that uh, it, it is an accessibility uh, issue for people who are physically unable to use a mouse. Um, and there are a lot of people in that category, um, but it also is indicative of other accessibility issues. If, if an application is not keyboard accessible, then probably it's not accessible in a lot of other ways as well. So this is um, in my list of three because it's easy to understand, it's easy to test. Anybody can test this, they don't need any special tools, they don't need assistive technology, they just need a keyboard. And you should be able to tab through an application, you should always be able to tell where you are, and then other keys may come into play, you know, as makes sense. So you might, you know, press enter or the space bar to click something like a button or a link. And sometimes uh, arrow keys may make sense to move through, you know, items in a set of items. Uh, sometimes the escape key makes sense to close something like a modal dialogue or something that pops up. So, you know, an intuitive keyboard interface where it's always easy to tell where you are. And you can also ask vendors to do this. So in the procurement process, when you're getting a demo from a, a uh, you know, a representative, vendor representative, then, you know, ask them, you know, maybe with some prep time in advance, we're going to ask you to demonstrate how you use this application with the keyboard. And so come prepared to be able to, to do that. Don't just rely entirely on your mouse. The third example is 4.1.2, which is, it's called name, role, and value. And this speaks to kind of the complexity of web applications these days, that you've got a lot of functionality that's happening uh, in response to user behavior. So I click on a button and something else happens on the page. Um, so I'm doing a lot of things that trigger changes on the same page. And you know all of this is, is happening dynamically. Um, so this is where ARIA comes in that the W3C specification uh, ARIA actually helps those sorts of, of rich, dynamic, interactive applications on the web to be accessible for people who are using assistive technologies. So a little bit more about ARIA in order to understand this success criterion, and you don't need to be a, an ARIA expert. Uh, I just wanna give you kind of a general sense of what ARIA is and what role it plays in web applications, because it is such a critical piece um, these days. First of all, it stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications. And it is a W3C specification that's intended to kind of plug the gaps where HTML alone does not provide enough information for an interface to be accessible to assistive technologies. So ARIA, supplements HTML and adds some, a little bit of additional markup that screen readers and other assistive technologies use to understand this interface. So it you know, specifically communicates, you know, whatever this is that I'm on, its role, what this thing is, what its current state is, and what its properties are. That's all communicated to assistive technologies and they pass that information on to, to users. So simple example here, I know a couple of you identified as web developers, um, but even those that are not, hopefully this is a simple enough example that it's not intimidating. But imagine you've got two elements on a page, you've got a button and that button has the text more info. 
and you've got a div or just a section or a division of content that has some text in it. In this case, it says this section contains more info. And that div has an ID. It's uh, in the info one div. So imagine that div is hidden by default and all you got is a button that says more info and the user clicks on that button and that makes the info one div appear. So that alone as coded here would not be an accessible experience because a screen reader, um, they're gonna they're gonna know that more info is a button because it is coded as a button. And so that's gonna be communicated to them. It'll say button more info and then they click on that using the enter key or the space bar. And that triggers this new section appearing, but they are not informed that anything has happened. They clicked, nothing seemed to happen. So maybe they click again and maybe that hides it. And that just keeps repeating itself and they're not getting the information they need for this to be accessible. So that's where ARIA comes in. And just by adding two ARIA attributes to the HTML, and again, you don't need to you know, remember these. You, there's not going to be a quiz. You don't necessarily need how to code an accessible button, but just the role of ARIA is, uh, in this case, ARIA controls equals info one is establishing an explicit relationship between that button and that div. It's saying when you click this button, it controls the div that has info one as an ID. And it also says aria expanded equals false. So that's the default state when that hidden content is not shown. And that will be communicated to screen readers. Um, and then when they click the more info button, that value changes to true and they're informed that something just happened. They're informed that it's now expanded and because of the nature of ARIA controls, some screen readers will allow them to jump directly to the new content that appeared. So by having that, though, just those two extra bits of information, we now have a fully accessible interface um, you know, for, for screen reader users. And so this is the purpose of ARIA, is, is to make things like that accessible. And so the role that is going to play as you're evaluating products, again, you don't need to know all the details, but a vendor should be expected if they have a dynamic application where things are happening and you're clicking on things and that, that causes changes, then in order for that to be accessible, they're going to have to use ARIA and they need to, uh, to explain that. They need to be able to explain that um, in a way that you know they need to, uh, to use ARIA and so you can kind of decide, you know, are they talking about ARIA here in their description of how they're they're you know, making their application accessible? So the um, <clears throat> moving on then to how vendors disclose information about their accessibility. A VPAT is kind of the standard tool by which that happens. It stands for Voluntary Product Accessibility Template, and um, it also um, is increasingly called accessibility conformance report, which is really a better, you know, a better phrase for it. But at, at the heart of the accessibility conformance report is a VPAT. And so, so really those are, are sort of synonymous terms, but you'll see this report under either of those terms. It is a standard means by which IT vendors can provide documentation on whether and how they meet accessibility standards. The most recent version is VPAT 2.5. So the versioning here does not have anything to do with WCAG versioning. So they're on a similar versioning path in that, you know, WCAG, I mentioned, you know, 2.1 is what we're obligated to meet legally. 2.2 is the latest version of, of WCAG. VPATs are also on the two dot series, but that's just a coincidence. So don't get those two dot versionings mixed up. Uh, <clears throat> so again, VPAT 2.5 is the latest version um, of VPAT. We require in our boilerplate RFP language that vendors submit VPAT 2.3 or higher because that is the first version of the VPAT <clears throat> that documents conformance to WCAG 2.1. So prior to that, 
um, VPAP was WCAG 2.0 or earlier. And since we're trying to meet WCAG 2.1, we need a VPAP that specifically answers the question, how well do you meet the WCAG 2.1 success criteria? So looking at version 2.3 um, and higher, there are four editions of VPATs. And this speaks to the standard that vendors are, um, are documenting. So the WCAG, WCAG 2.1 is our standard. So that's what we need is a VPAT that documents their ability to meet WCAG 2.1. So there is a WCAG 2.1 version. Uh, there's also a section 508 version a European Union version, and an INT or international version, which actually incorporates all of the above standards. And so, so either the WCAG 2.1 version or the INT version will meet our needs. And a lot of letter vendors will provide the INT version, so they just fill out you know, one big form that um, meets the needs of all their customers. So this is what a a VPAT looks like. It's just a blank template. It's actually available in a Word file. So vendors download this and then they fill it out. And it's got in the left column a list of all of the criteria. And since we're looking at the WCAG version, then the criteria are WCAG 2.1 um, uh, success criteria. And then there's a conformance level column and a remarks and explanations column. So those columns, conformance level is a multiple choice column. Um, they should enter one of the following, either their product supports that particular success criterion, or it partially supports it, or it does not support it, or it's not applicable, or they didn't evaluate it. So it should be one of those. And there's a little bit of fuzziness between partially supports and does not support. It's sort of like the difference between partly sunny and partly cloudy. You know, how is it mostly support or is it mostly does not support? And so you got to kind of look closely at that because they may try to make it sound better than it really is. Um, but the devil is in the details. And that is in the remarks and explanations column where that's what really gives us a deeper sense of um, why did you rate your product in the way that you rated it on this success criterion. If it does not support, what what's the, what are the significance, uh, what is the significance of that? If it partially supports, you know, what are the shortcomings? If it supports, you know, what are the good things that your product does that uh, led you to say that it supports this success criteria? So we really need detail in order to come away with a deeper understanding of how accessible this product or service is. So once they've provided a VPAT, then the next step is to validate the information that they provided. And so uh, you can do that by reviewing a VPAT. So that's kind of the first step in the process. And I like to think of it as a communication starter. It's not, you know, don't look at the VPAT as the source of truth. It's like, oh, they've provided a VPAT. They say they support every success criteria. This is good. It's a fully accessible product. We're gonna go ahead and purchase it. Um, but look at it as, as a conversation starter. What questions do you have after you review their VPAT? Uh, first of all, there are 11 required fields in the instructions. It specifically says, you know, what those are and identifies them as required. And so that's one thing is, you know, did they fill this out accurately and fill in all the required fields? In particular, there are five that, um, that I look at and I'm most interested in. One is... Make, let's make sure that we're talking about you know, the right product. We're going to purchase this product and this version of this product. We want to make sure that the VPAT is a, is a reflection of that product in a reasonably recent version. Also, the report date kind of speaks to the same thing. Is this current information or you know, is it two or three years old? In which case, has your product been updated any since you know, two or three years ago? If so, we'll need an update, you know, on the state of your accessibility. Also contact information uh, for follow-up questions. Somebody filled out the VPAT. Ideally, the person named for this, this field is the person that filled out the VPAT. So, you know, they'll have the answers to those questions. 
evaluation methods used? How did they how did they go about filling this out? How did they test their product for accessibility? And just to make sure, once again, that we're on the same page, what are the applicable standards and guidelines that you're applying in this VPAT? We need WCAG 2.1 level 2A compliance. That's what, you know, we want to explicitly stated that that's what's documented here in this report. So a quick guide to reading a VPAT. First of all, who completed it? Um, it ideally an independent accessibility consultant. That's really you know what we're hoping for is you know a company who has hired somebody to review their product, somebody who has accessibility expertise, rather than just relying on you know people internally to do that work. Um, we we will trust a third party, an independent accessibility consultant, over um, an internal uh, VPAP. Also, did they follow the instructions? If not, then you know that may suggest that either a VPAT is new to them or it's something that they're not taking seriously. Both of those are at least yellow flags, if not red flags. Do they seem to be knowledgeable of accessibility? So that's where you can kind of hone in on those, just those three success criteria that we talked about and have a look at those and, and ask, you know, do, do their answers here make sense given your knowledge of those three success criteria? And ultimately, after reading the VPAT, do you know more about the accessibility of their product and what follow-up questions do you have? So just looking real quickly at a couple, a few examples here. Um, the, the first one here is a really bad example because they've actually taken that template to extremes and removed the third column altogether. So there are no remarks or explanations. So this is an actual VPAT that we ran across a few years ago where without remarks and explanations, you know, this is meaningful. Uh, we know that they, they claim there, there are two, just in the screenshot, success criteria where they partially support, but we don't know what the nature of their shortcomings are for those, those issues. The next one is uh, the remarks and explanation column is there, but it's not used well. Um, they have only identify, they've only added something in that column for, for success criteria that are not applicable. And arguably those are the ones where we don't really need an explanation. We know what not, not applicable means, um, but we wanna know all the others they say they support. We wanna know how they support that success criterion. The next one, we're looking at 2.1.1. So this is the keyboard accessibility. And this is, they say they partially support. There are some shortcomings with this product. And in the remarks and explanations column, they say all functionality of the content is operable through a keyboard interface without requiring specific timings for individual keystrokes. However, there are minor exceptions. For example, the calendar widget on the manage section is not keyboard operable. However, alternatively, the date can be directly entered into the date field. So if we think about what that's describing there, you've got a calendar widget, a mouse user can click on that, they can click on a date within the calendar widget and that automatically populates the date field. So that, that widget is not accessible for a keyboard user. And so a few things kind of jump out at me about this. One is that it is detailed. So they are providing enough information that I understand the accessibility limitations of this particular piece of their interface. And now I need to make some decisions about how critical that is. Um, they also provide a workaround, which is also a positive that they're not just saying, you can't do this as a keyboard user, this is inaccessible to you. They're saying there is an option and you can enter the date directly. You're not gonna be able to access the calendar widget and there are benefits to being able to access the calendar widget, but at least you can type in a date. And so, yeah, so this, you know, this looks a lot better than the examples that we saw previously. Um, it's a conversation starter. So the next question I have for them is, when are you going to fix this so that the calendar widget is actually um, keyboard accessible? The next one also related to keyboard accessibility. Um, they give themselves a rating of partially support, just like the previous example. Um, and they say that they do this because there are some specific things that they were where uh, keyboard that are not keyboard accessible. 
the publications imports functionality is not operable with the keyboard alone. Users may elect not to use this functionality and complete the tasks of entering publications manually. And the rich text formatting toolbar functionality is not operable with keyboard alone, but keyboard shortcuts do exist. Users may elect not to use this functionality. So the second one, I'm imagining a rich text editor that's got things like bold and italics. And, uh, and so it sounds like, you know, you can bold your text by using probably alt B and alt italicize using alt I. Um, so that's, you know, uh, maybe not as severe as the first one where it sounds like there is no workaround and this particular functionality can only be done without, uh, with a mouse. And so, Users may elect not to use this functionality and complete the task of entering publications manually. It sounds like that might be a, a much different sort of task, that that's gonna be a lot more work. Um, and you know, being able to import publications is probably just a few steps. Entering them manually is gonna be a lot of steps. So those two you know, sound like they're, they're not in sync. But this is a conversation I'm going to have to have with the vendor. You know, that sounds like a pretty significant difference in, in experience. And, you know, can you elaborate on how this works? And if it is indeed, you know, that the publications import functionality really is a time saver and every user needs to be able to use that, then when are you going to fix this so that it's accessible? And let's get a roadmap with some timelines and, and add that to the contract so that we know you we can count on you fixing this so that you know when we deploy this uh if it's not fully accessible out of the gate you know we're putting ourselves at risk under the ada and, and that's not a good situation for us so speaking of contracts i want to hand off to lynn to talk about that piece of the puzzle and i can go ahead and continue sharing my screen if you like lynn and you could just tell me when to advance thank you terrell and thank you, everybody. Um, yes, this is my piece about accessibility assurances in contracts, because all of the things that Terrell has talked about leading up to this, about how to evaluate accessibility, what we need to know. Um, for those of you that have done contracts before, uh, most of you know that having it in the actual contract, unless it's in the contract itself, it really won't hold water. And so otherwise, it's basically just sales collateral. And so what we're gonna talk about here is kind of how to make, not make all of your hard work go to waste and also how to have those conversations with your vendors and how to make it meaningful. So next slide, please, Terrell. All right, so partnering with stakeholders. You know, the phrase we use a lot in contracts is if you're not early, you're late. And as we all know, we often don't have the luxury of time, um, especially in the university world. But, you know, it's very rare that, you know, we get a very long or um, extensive lead time. And so engaging your end users as early as possible is key. Um, you know, having those conversations with them about what is required. And a good example is Trevor, um, who is on this call. I actually, he's, I get to use him as a great example. Um, he's a good example of engaging end users early. He's aware of accessibility. He knows what it is. He's thinking about it before it goes into his solicitation. And that is excellent. And But if Trevor were new and Trevor had never heard the word accessibility before, that's where our team, you know, if we had enough time would say, okay, great, we're gonna do a solicitation with you. Here's the accessibility requirements we need to get in here and help counsel them on that to get those documents in and give your vendors a heads up, not just in solicitations, but in other contracts that this is an expectation um, that we need to have in their agreement. And so part of that is if you're involved in the procurement or contracting process, every organization structure is a little bit different. Um, be involved in that before a final decision is made. It is very hard when you're at the very end and everything is negotiated um, to get that in at the very end. Everybody has negotiation fatigue, they're on a timeline, you have to go back and have everything rewritten. So it's much better to start, you know, at the first part of the process as well. And also being as an end user, being involved before the final decision is made. Because sometimes we see, oh, 
you know, a whole committee has reviewed this and they really want to go with this particular vendor, but they're not accessible. But there were two or three other ones that might have been. So if you can get a seat at the table before the final decision is made and everybody you know, doesn't have fatigue and wants to go back and do double work, you have the opportunity to influence that decision with regards to you know, accessibility, diversity, and all kinds of areas. And that's part of getting the seat at the table when selecting vendors. And if you're in the public space like we are, part of getting that seat at the table is you know, doing solicitations, um, evaluating some of our vendors that we have on contract have already been evaluated for accessibility. And so it's kind of baked into the whole process that we currently have. Um, and also involve your other process partners if you have them. Some organizations do, some don't, but we lean heavily and work heavily with Terrell's team in accessibility. Um, our, we call it the CISO's office, Chief, Chief Information Services office. We have some other IT partners as well and non-IT contract partners. But sometimes if a vendor, you know, if we need some more negotiation leverage and some more evaluation eyes that are above our expertise, we, ac we, we absolutely, you know, we'll call them up and ask them to, you know, look at it for us, help us talk to the suppliers, work out a solution. You know, if you're not this accessible today, can we get a timeline and assurances as to when you will be? Very similar to if you're doing a construction project, you know, if you can't get this building built by August 1st, can you be three quarters complete? Can we take occupation by this day, you know, and get some definite assurances because even that's better than having no accessibility whatsoever. So there's some options you can put into place. So next slide, please, Terrell. And so as a standard, and we do this at the UW, um, when you incorporate it into your processes, you know, where does it fit in? How do I get it in there? And the best practice is to embed it into your boilerplate terms that you have, if you have them as an organization. Um, government organizations and large companies often do. They have their set of terms that they prefer to use, um, as do we at the university. And so we have that embedded into our website and boilerplate terms as a standard. This is our baseline that we would like from all vendors. You know, we would like them all to be accessible. And so we include those writers or terms into all um, RFPs, requests for proposals, solicitations or contracts, regardless of size. You know, our thought is, is that it doesn't matter if two people are going to use this or two million, that it should be accessible. Uh, those two people are just as important as the two million other people. And also there might be more adopters after those two, two people use a solution. So it's just as important to get in regardless. And also sometimes circumstances change. You know, people's physical capabilities can change due to various circumstances and conditions. So if something, you know, if I don't need accessibility today, I might next week or next month, depending on, you know, what happens in my life. And so you want your employees to, you know, you want to be able to keep them and their knowledge. Or if I get a new employee um, or a new team member, I would like them to be able to use the tools that we have, you know, and not have any barriers to employment. And that everything must be in documents to be enforceable. That's um, a very standard contract provision. So if a vendor gives you a VPAT and it looks wonderful, unless you have, it's basically sales collateral. It's a lot like a sales brochure. Um, this is what we can do. We're awesome or we're not awesome or we're sort of awesome, depending on the example that Terrell gave you. Um, that's great, but that doesn't tie into your contract. And it doesn't say, oh, if we change something tomorrow, we will fix it. And a real life example that I had was we were using a video vendor um, for website for video captioning at one of our um, campuses. And that vendor was accessible. They had, you know, captions. We were going to widely adopt them. And that was great. And then about one month before go live and roll out, they had a system and software update and they could no longer do closed captioning. And that was an issue <laughs> for us. And we actually had the accessibility writer in the contract that said, yep, we will meet these standards. And so we asked them, all right, you know, you had this system update, are you going to fix it? And if so, when? And they told us at that time they didn't know and they couldn't give us a timeline. 
and their accessibility had changed since the contract was signed and they could no longer meet that contractual requirement. And since it was going to be widely adopted, um, that actually gave us the leverage to cancel that vendor, which is never our first option. You know, our first option is always to try to work something out and not just switch vendors willy nilly. But in this case, they basically told us flat out, we can't do this, we won't do this, and we can't give you a timeline. And because this was such a large solution, um, we had to terminate the vendor and switch to a vendor that was accessible. And that's never our first, you know, the first thing we want to do. But in that case, it gave us the leverage to do that once we had exhausted all other options. And it also talks about liability as well, because if the vendor says, yes, this is accessible, and I will always make it accessible or do my best, and they don't, and you have an accessibility issue, um, someone says, oh, you know, I need accessibility and this, this solution is not accessible, I can't use it, then, you know, that comes down to whose fault is that and who should pay for those um, accommodations for that person, you know, to help them, you know, with either additional software or somebody to have job aids for them or transcription or whatever it is they might need. And so that puts the liability on the one who said it was accessible, which is the vendor, which it's not about cost savings. It's really about, you know, equity and people, but also, you know, if someone asserts in a contract that they can do something um, and then they change that and say, this no longer works that way. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna sell you a car with four tires and then you get the car and nope, now you've only got three. You know, that's probably going to be a problem and that shouldn't be your fault. And so it's kind of the same in a contract. And so one of the other things we do at the university is we have standard training for all procurement team members on all of our IT writers, other type of writers and accessibility, why it's important and where it comes into play. And not just for you know website accessibility as well. And our accessibility team can vet vendors prior to their being approved for use. And so if we have a concern about a vendor, if something is not seeming quite right, we're unsure, or you know they're giving us some mixed messages or some contract language, requests that we don't quite follow, that's where we'll bring in Terrell and his team um, to make sure that we're not getting into something that we might not want to get into as far as contracts go. And then any deviations, you know, a lot of us know there's a lot of pressure, you know, to sign things, get things done, people have deadlines. And so at our organization, um, the authority structure is that those deviations are only approved by somebody with executive authority. So if Lynn McGill was hired two days ago and somebody said, Lynn, we have to do this, get it signed in two days. And the vendor says, I don't wanna be accessible, Lynn. And I've been at the university for two whole days. And um, should I really be the one approving that without understanding the impact or the financial responsibility that it could put on my organization? And so at the university, we you know, usually have somebody in a position who understands that, who can say, okay, I'm willing to take that risk or, okay, based on these decisions and these you know, guards that we've put in place and is there enough money in my budget to cover accessibility accommodations, should something go wrong, um, then that person should be making those decisions. And so, because that, that's usually what it ends up at is if you don't have something accessible and it's supposed to be, and you've asserted that, then you have to make accommodations for those individuals and you have to make some provisions for that. And that's that's rarely a free process. And so you wanna make sure that somebody understands, you know, what that could mean for them, you know, and for your organization and also for your organizational culture. Um, next one, please, Terrell. And this is our writer sample. Um, this isn't the whole thing, but this is what we put in our contracts. And one of the main points that I do want to highlight is if you're not familiar with contracts, if your writers are not referred to in the in the body of the document, then they usually don't hold legally. Um, we always joke that a staple is not a um, does not hold up in court. And so if I have a, doc, a contract document, I have to note that the accessibility writer is a writer to this agreement or something like that, otherwise it won't hold up. 
and it won't be enforceable later if it gets separated. And so that's my only comment on that one. And that's it, we are at the question phase. So thank you, Terrell. Thank you, Len. And do we have any questions? This is Gaby. I've been monitoring the chat and we do not have any questions in the chat, but if anybody has a question that they'd like to ask Terrell or Lynn, you're welcome to um, either raise your hand or unmute yourself. And Trevor, looks like you have a question. I've got a few, but um, start with one. Um, so like in the previous rebuild for a website that's based on a content management system. Um, we're evaluating vendors for their ability to, um, you know, do this rebuild, do a migration from the old CMS to the new CMS and so on. It kind of sounds like the VPAT isn't really something I would use as a tool since they're providing development services and not a, a, a product, right? Um, so, in that case, I'm wondering what your suggestions are when I am evaluating vendors on um, uh, their, uh, I guess, previous experience, um, their knowledge of meeting, you know, 2.1 level 2A, you know, and, and so forth. If that's just something that comes out during sort of our interview process with them, or if there's maybe something more of substance that that you could recommend that they might provide us to uh, to help uh, evaluate. Yeah, I would specifically, as as you just did in framing the question, uh, ask ask them or make clear to them that you need a website that that meets WCAG two point one level two A, and ask them for examples of previous work they've done that also meets WCAG two point one level two A. And, and then uh, evaluate to the extent that you're able those examples. And so they provide okay. you with accessibility. Examples of accessibility, there are a number of tools, you know, that you can use to kind of spot check accessibility and uh, feel free to reach out to us too. We can kind of coach you through that process of how to do a, you know, okay. quick, quick eval of some, some example websites. So I guess the, the, Follow up to that one then is um, it needs to be part of the contract or else it's not enforceable to, um, I suppose, um, I I'm thinking of things like, it, um, you know, measuring it with a particular tool, making sure that it meets, um, I don't know, all of it, all of level two or like a particular percentage, because I know there's going to be project constraints where maybe like hitting 80% of it um, is, is something good that maybe like on a monthly basis, they are providing a sort of a report of, you know, how much they're, how much, what they've, what they're building, what's under development, you know, is, uh, is meeting it, you know, that sort of stuff is, is all of that bullet points that should be in a contract. I would say yes. Um, okay. we've, had some, we, we've had some with timelines and milestones and for some larger agreements that have been a little higher dollar in enterprise, we've even had um, penalties for not meeting accessibility at certain stages oh, interesting. Or, or discounts. Basically mm -hmm. it's almost like um, liquidated damages in a construction contract. Um, but you know, if you're, if the product is not this functional by this timeline that you promised us, then we get a discount, you know, and if you're, if we give you a notice to cure, then you're in default. We never want to just default, you know, that's, that doesn't work for anybody. Um, but normally, you know, you give, you also have to have a backup plan. You know, if you're intending that this vendor doesn't work out for whatever reason, and they're not meeting the scope, what is your backup plan to get another vendor and, you know, switch solutions if that is, you know, that important and is not going to work for you. So that's always a, you know, a consideration as well. And also partly why it's, you know, the best option is to hold your current vendor and work with them to get in compliance rather than 
just saying you're fired and we're going to unplug this and leave everybody with no solution next week. You know, because yeah. that's, <laughs> that's never good. <laughs> also, if they're if they're building this from scratch, then I would argue that you know, there shouldn't even be percentages. That the requirement should be they build something that meets the standard, and this is the standard that we're legally obligated okay. to meet. And there's no percentages in the law, and so you know, that mm. you know, if we were to say seventy five percent accessible is good enough for the vendor, it's not going to be good enough for us if somebody were to you know, were to sue us because of the of that inaccessible website. So okay. they, you know, they should, it's always best to build accessibility in from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, that should be the expectation of the vendor. Okay. So hit all 50 points in the, all the criteria. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah I guess that's the, that's the concern. So if we hit 59 on a particular page, like, or, or 49, I mean, not 50, like, in theory, somebody could. Well, yeah, so there, and this is all, you know, this crosses into uh, Beth's turf now for the Office oh, okay. of Compliance. <laughs> but I will <laughs> okay. say, you know, the the rules do have, um, you know, some some language that allows us some protection if the violation does not impact functional accessibility. And so, you know, if you've got a color contrast violation in the footer, I mean, that's, you know, just a, a bad example because it's so easy to fix. Surely that wouldn't be a thing. Sure. But but some kind of accessibility problem that does not impact, you know, a, a user's ability to access the primary content or or perform the primary function of the site, then then they will be lenient. The, the courts are sort of instructed to be lenient Somebody could still sue, you know, but uh, hopefully that, you know, that provides a uh, a defense as well as, you know, a, you know, keeps people from just being drive by, you know, um, yeah. lawsuit filers. Um, yeah. It's got to impact, have a real, uh, an actual impact on, on an actual user uh, and their ability to you know, access information or perform a function. Thank you. Anybody else? We are a little bit over the top of the hour, but I want to make sure we get everybody's questions answered. If not, appreciate uh, appreciate everybody coming by. And um, if you haven't I don't know if this was already typed into chat, but uw.edu slash access tech is our website for accessible technology. And it's a have a look at that. Lots of information there about web accessibility. The procurement page is there, and there's, there's also a list of events. Uh, lots of opportunity. You know, on a monthly basis, we have events where you can come and learn more about accessibility or network with others who are. Yeah. You know, also, you know, learning about or passionate about accessibility. So, hope to see you at some future events. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.